be complete without some unabashed commentary from our own Emmy Award-winning hairstylist, Marquis. Yeah. Marquis! Yeah. <laughs> Men on hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, believe I'm at the Most table. Most fabulous hair, baby. Who had the best hair? Well, first, let me start off by giving a disclaimer. Oh. Um, just because I don't like um, how someone wears their hair doesn't mean that they're a mess or don't have um, a fashion sense. It means that they haven't exercised the word no okay. to some overzealous hairstylist who says, darling, the look this year, it must be a coconut. Yeah. And you go to your event with your hair a coconut. Yeah. Okay. And so... <laughs> but you assume they know what they're talking about, Mark. Right, That's but you, you really have to, if, you know, mm -hmm. take a little word of advice from me. Yeah. If it feels stupid, it is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Urban Wall Street Project. I'm your host, Earl Christian III, of course. And you just saw a dynamic brother. I'm talking about Mr. Marquis. He's an amazing hairstylist, five-time Emmy Award winning for The View. So we're going to talk to Marquis. He got a lot of positive things happening. He has a fashion show that he does monthly in here in New York. The brother's thorough. Without further ado, Marquis. What's going on, brother? Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Congratulations, first and foremost, brother, on your five Emmys. Thank you. It has to be a good feeling. It was a surprise. It was a surprise. <laughs> so I'm going to go ask the first one. What was it like when you see that first one? Then we're going to get into it. When that first feeling, what was it like when you got that first one? When I first got the first Emmy, I didn't believe that I could get an Emmy. So it was a big surprise. Mm -hmm. The real um, test was getting the second Emmy. And that was the time when it was nerve wracking because I realized that you can get an Emmy. Right. The first time I was the new kid on the block and I was like, oh, I'm not going to get an Emmy. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't that bad. But the second one was a little bit, okay, we could get this or we could lose this. It could be embarrassing or cool. Right, right. Yeah. Now, hairstyle. I know so many, you know, young ladies, women, people want to get into hairstyle. Because, you know, hair is, I mean, that's people's fashion. People put a lot of stock in their hair. It makes them feel good, self-esteem, whatever the case may be. When did you know that hairstyling was your passion? I knew at a very young age. First of all, my hair is unusual. I'm black, and I have hair that's sort of in, the, in between. Mm -hmm. And so my parents... Well, my mom, she um, spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. Mm. She would take me to the black barber, the white barber, the white hairstylist, the black hairstylist. Right. I always wind up looking like a mess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then when I was about a teenager, I found somebody that could do it. And then I was like, hmm, I would go in. I would say, let's do this and let's do that. And then I said, well, maybe I should do that. Mm -hmm. And that's how I did it, just basically from my own need, necessity. Okay, okay. Now, The View, how did you come to work on The View? Well, um, I came to New York from Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and what happened was I had been doing hair maybe 13 years in D.C., and I said I did everything I could do in D.C., so I need to move to New York where the fashion is. Right. So I basically wanted to be in the fashion, and I knew that there was fashion, TV, and music here in New York, and that's what I wanted to be a part of. So I came here with $1,200. Mm. <laughs> and a car, and I had no friends, no job, no place to stay, and I was, um, I just rode my car around and looking for salons and saying, do you need a stylist? So I got a job, obviously, and then basically I read a book, and it had a list of agencies, and I picked like three or four of them, mm -hmm. and then I got an agent. Okay. Um, and then the agent set me up with the interview with the um, view. So that's how that's how the that's the um, short version. So so and I, and I appreciate it because you know it's all about you know with, with Urban Wall Street it's all about we got to get our hustle on. A lot of people have a variety of hustles, but it's all about that tenacity and that commitment. So you said you came with a dream and some passion, twelve hundred dollars a car, and I'm about to take over New York whether they're ready or not. I think that you're supposed to follow your heart and do what makes you feel good, and I think that the good comes out of it. At least my experience mm -hmm. is when I follow my heart and do what I feel, good comes out of it because good really came out of it. I got what I wanted. Right, right. Now I see, you know, we, we're seeing you over here in The View. Well, was this in the earlier days when you were working <laughs> on The View? That brings back memories. Yes, you see, saw um, look like two people. Oh. She lost a whole person. <laughs> that, was the, um, that was probably my second year in New York. Okay. Um, and it was fun. That brings up memories. Oh, I miss the ladies talking trash with them. Right, right. <laughs> That's cool. So now you come to New York and um, you get you an agent. And the first, the first uh, gig you booked through your agent was The View. Oh, absolutely not. No, 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 okay. no. I had to um, crawl. Okay. I did the little... Um, ah! <laughs> I did the little beginner magazines. Can I say the, like, the, the, the black um, sure. hood... Um, hair magazines you that got, you see on the newsstand. And it's important that you say that. The reason I ask you that because I want individuals to know 
that, that are aspiring to do what you're doing and, and achieve what you've achieved, that you're not just going to do it overnight. So oh, yeah. Let them know I you had to start. Cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and let me tell you something. I didn't get the agent um, either. I kind of had to court the agent. The agent didn't really want me. I had my, 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 my sister's pictures in my portfolio uh -huh. when I first came here. And the agent didn't really want me, but he kind of liked me. So I would do things like this. I would call him up and say, I just had a photo shoot. Could you help me decide which pictures I could put in my book? Right. And then I, I finally got connected to one of those um, those black hair magazines. Right. Can I say the black ghetto hood ones? Hey, hey brother. <laughs> the black ghetto hood magazine. <laughs> so I had finally booked that on my own. Mm -hmm. And I would call the agent and say, you know what, I have this job. Could you um, invoice it for me? Because uh, any way I could try to get in. So I called myself right. courting him. So eventually, maybe uh, about six months, he said, hey, Marquis, I got this gig. It's only 200 you want to do it? And I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got in by courting the agent, by asking questions. I would, I'd be the one calling up every other week saying, making up something to ask. Right. So then, <laughs> so how I understand it, because we talk about it, is you didn't, um, you know, my mother taught me as a young child, pride goes before the fall. And sometimes you got to be proud, but at the same time, you got to be humble. So you were not afraid to humble yourself to get to where you wanted to be. Well, I, like I said, I followed what I felt was natural. Mm -hmm. It was also natural for me to do that, you understand? Okay. Because when I first came here, I actually didn't know things. And I actually had to learn. So me asking the agent all those questions, I was learning. Okay. So I was trying to learn my way through, right. and I kind of stuck to him. Right. I've been with the same agent for 15 years, right. Ken Barboza. Okay. He got me this Emmy. That's what it is. <laughs> let's, let's see this. Now, you know, now a lot of people in TV aspire to, to, to achieve one of these. So now you receive one, you feel good about it. You know, I did my thing, and uh, now you get two. Now, once you get the three, four, and five, what are you feeling now? By the time you get the fifth, were you feeling Jordan S? Like, oh, come on, okay, I, I do this. I feel like I want to make a whole lot of money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, after I got about five and I was making the same amount of money, I was like, okay, is that tacky to say? Hey. <laughs> Well, it's the truth, whatever. Right. Um, I felt like I needed to make some more money after I got five, so I decided I had to cut the ties from the view okay. so I could go make some more money or at least be in control or be my own master of what I was doing. Right. So if I ain't had the money, I at least need to be the master. So I'm the master now. All right. So now tell me, working on the view, what was one of your, what was one of the greatest, uh, I guess one of your greatest feelings or moments, you know, of working a part of the view for five, five years, was it? What was one of your greatest moments? I mean, outside of winning an Emmy, of course. You know, we have ups and downs, but what you, you learn know, from it? I probably was the odd one in my family. Mm -hmm. And I think that by being on The View and by getting the awards, it gave me validation in my family in okay. a way. And so I am no longer the odd one. I am very respected. I know that. And I was going to lead up to that because <laughs> a lot of times when we follow our passion, our heart, if it's not the general conventional nine to five, it's something in the artistic arena, you know, family is not always as forthcoming and supportive. So my next question was going to be, how was your support system during, yeah. your, during the, your early days? I come from Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. That is the government. Yes. And I want to be an artist. I mean, they didn't, no one in my family was a hairstylist. Mm -hmm. So for me to be creative, they was like, is that a job? Right. So it took them a few years for me not to ask money, even when I first became a hairstylist, right. for them to take it seriously. They basically didn't take um, being a hairstylist even seriously. But of know. course they do now. Oh, they take it serious. So now you've come to New York and you've conquered the city a little something, you've conquered the view, you've got five Emmys under your belt, you know that you're established, credentialed, respect is there, people recognizing this brother has talent. So now you're moving on to the next phase that you're in New York. So we bring us up to uh, more current and you have fashion. That's what we see Marquis secret, yes. right, which is fashion. So tell us about this fashion shows that you're doing and how that transpired. So what happened, so I've been privileged in this industry, basically. Um, I don't know why I was chosen to be able to get five Emmys and not, have... But you're not mad. No. <laughs> and have my agent and work around celebrities, and it's natural. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there were some people that weren't getting seen, and there's a lot of talent out there that doesn't have the money behind them or they don't have the connections. Right. Um, so I decided that I wanted to do my little part for the little underdog that doesn't get seen. Right. So I decided to create Marquis Secret. Okay. And what I basically do is 
I introduce new fashion designers, okay. new makeup artists, and new models mm. to the fashion scene in New York. Oh, mm. I try to as much as I can. Right, right. So now, how long have you been uh, doing that? I'm on my second season. Well, I see. I see. We have some things right here. So what am I? What are we seeing here? We're seeing uh, Marquis Secret, and I'm um, interviewing Diego Diaz, one of the designers that I found. Mm -hmm. And that's me, and I call my um, wedding. Oh no, this this outfit looks like a wedding, doesn't it? But it's actually inspired by um, Japanese. So this is a fashion show at Marquis Secret, and I believe we were at Nest Nightclub. And he said, Diego is the designer here. He said that this was men's wear inspired women's wear. Okay. <laughs> that was his concept. All the designers have their own concept. Look at me, Sash Satan. <laughs> Don't hurt him. Don't hurt him, Marquis. With Diego Diaz, the designer of my Marquis Secret number three. Okay, so Diego, how does it feel now that it's all over? Wow, it's a relief. Um, it was a lot of, you know, a lot of hard work, but now it's over. Everyone loved it. Um, so I'm happy with the success. Tell me, what was your inspiration for your clothes? The inspiration to my clothes, actually, it was sort of men's wear inspired women's wear. What made you get into this men's wear, women's wear inspired stuff? I come from a family of sewers, tailors, and dressmakers, so it's something that I've been around. And I originally started my career as a men's wear designer. Uh, so sometimes a lot of the influences that I draw are that I, I draw from are men's wear influences because what used to really annoy me about women's wear when I start to get into it is that they don't make women's wear with the tailoring and quality of men's wear, which I just thought there was a void in that market. So I said, look, when I do women's wear, I'm going to make sure that I put men's wear quality, men's wear tailoring into my women's wear. Wow, you know, I think that's interesting okay. because what I like about what I see you right, do right. is I think that so th this is your really clothes great. So for men do these fun. Shows. So now, how, how often do these fashion shows occur? And I'm always looking for fun. I do them once a month. Once a month. Because what I found is there are so many designers. Right. There's so much talent. There's so many models. There's so many people that want to get their work seen. So it kind of naturally builds. Mm -hmm. Like just by doing the shows, I get designers coming. Can I do your show? Can I do your show? Can I, you know? Right. And models, can I walk in your show and makeup artists? I mean, I am booked into August. Really? Yes. With, now, you, when you say book, you're booked with, so you have, so I'm looking at, so, because you know we're going we're to come and shoot some of those shows. Mm -hmm. Urban Walsh, you're definitely going to be on location because it's a beautiful situation right now. Um, so you book, so you book um, venues? I do. I book, I do everything. I'm the producer from the bottom to the top. Okay. I book the venues. Um, I, I, um, so I do that all around the city at different places, like I did it at, um, this right here was Nest. Uh -huh. I've done it at Ultra. Okay. I, my favorite spot is Bukuru. That's where I've been doing it now. It's a spot in the East Village. It's okay. an African place. Right. That's my favorite. Okay. Um, yeah, so I um, do it all. Right, right. So now we got the fashion lines going. and Now, well, now the exposure that the designers get from the show, do you have sponsors? <gasps> Oh, I absolutely do. That's okay. a good question. Macy's sponsors my show. Excellent. And what happens is I, Macy's does the gift bags, mm -hmm. and Macy's gives an opportunity for the designer to show their line to them. And they put, a, put together a package to present to them to get some of their pieces in Macy's. Because Macy's is actually looking for the mi minority designers. Right, right. You know, and it's, and it's ironic you said that because I just I did an interview with a young brother. It's this 15-year-old kid out of a high school in Brooklyn, and he just ties. What's his name? His name is uh, J.D. Dren. <laughs> you know Johan? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, JD, but he's 15. I'm, I'm interested. I haven't had a tie and designer. Says, he's a tie designer. And, he's, <laughs> and Macy's, and it's ironic you said Macy's because Macy's is actually giving him a trunk show mm -hmm. this February for right. Black History Month. So this kid is 15 years old in 10th grade, and he's making stacks already right. with his tie thing. So he's doing it. So Because so Macy's great. is on the lookout for minority designers. And that's a great thing. I know a lot of people might not even even know, know it, that. You know yeah. what I'm so that's a beautiful situation. Now, of course, you know you got a, a lot of accolades and things are good, but there's always the downside. A lot of people that want to get into the game, they see the glitz and the glamour, and they think it's always peaches and cream. But we know sometimes Murphy's Law does kick in. <laughs> Can you share with me, Omar, there's maybe one or two times where you know Murphy's Law was just out of control? Yes, <laughs> I had a show at Touch Nightclub, mm -hmm. and Touch. 
they they pay for everything. Mm -hmm. They rolled out the red carpet. They they pay for a stage. They gave me two hour open bar. They sent out the flyers. They made them. Mm. They promoted it. They did everything. And when we were getting ready, it was actually Diego Diaz. Okay. He did that show. Mm -hmm. They said that they didn't like the people that were coming to the show. Didn't like the way they looked. Oh. And they so we had maybe a hundred people in and maybe 50 people outside, including my friends, and including Diego Diaz's family. Wow. And they still wanted us to do the show. And Diego was in, in, infuriated. He said that he worked so hard on his show, his collection, and he couldn't see his family, couldn't see it. Now, so. this, now this is real, because we want to talk about it, because no things happened. They didn't like the people that were coming. Was it the style of dress? Was it the personality? Was it the complexion? What was the scenario? I don't know, but it was 50 black people standing outside. <laughs> Look, that speaks for itself. I don't know what those black people had on, but I know it was 50 black people and it wasn't no white people. All right. Now, as a professional, things going to happen. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times, you know, we react on our emotions. But when you want to maintain in this professional arena, you want to get ahead, you have to know how to play the game. That is absolutely right. So, so I had to make a speech. OK. <laughs> Tell us about that. And that was probably the time that I have exercised the most restraint. Mm -hmm. Because generally, I don't have it. Generally, I am me, who I am, and I'm free, and I say everything I want to say. Right. But this time, I just gave a speech, and I just said that this has taught me that we're all here together. Mm -hmm. And we all have to learn to live here together. Right. Because that was what I got out of that. I got out of, wow. Some people don't know that we're all here together. See, not, it doesn't matter how much money we have, right, right. what color our skin is, or what um, latest designers we're wearing. We're all here together, and we're all people. No and question. so that made me grow. Okay. And that's the way that I grew, and that's the way that I took it, that Excellent. whole experience. Now, one of the things that's very important that I'm always educating. I like to entertain my people, but I want to educate them. So it's like edutainment is always the underlying theme of the Urban Wall Street. So people looking. You know, we're talking five, three fundamentals. Anyone who really serious about getting in the hairstyling game and really making it happen for their career, purchase of advice. <laughs> um, the top three you could think of. Like you, these three, if you don't miss nothing, you don't miss these three. Well, you got to, um, I think, be true to the art. Okay. I think sometimes going to school, um, learning stuff, messes up the art. Okay. <laughs> it kind of reins you in. Right. So don't be reined in with the constraints when you learn. Okay. But I also believe go to the cheapest school and go work at the best hair salon around and surround yourself with the best. Right. And don't be intimidated by it even if you're not there. Right. Because you're going to get something. Okay. Now, of course, a lot of people come to you aspiring stylists, aspiring fashion models. Oh, and they, and they probably ask you a million questions. What do I have to do to be the top model? What do I have to do to really make it happen? You deal with models. What's some <laughs> of the pitfalls, or I should say mistakes, misconceptions people may have about this game? I don't think that about modeling. Oh, I think girls, women have to be tall and skinny, and it has to be natural. And you have to, mm, and you know what else you have to have? You have to have some an inner thing that sparkles. Mm -hmm. You understand? No question. Some people have that and some people don't. Right. And I believe it's a little bit of um, honesty. A little bit of honesty. Yeah. And I now, think that it shows through. Right, it right. It makes you glow in a different way. So do you think that some people may not, uh, because they're not honest with themselves, that definitely uh, will hold them back? Yeah. I think that, tr and trying too hard, trying you too don't necessarily have to try so hard. Right. If you are something, you are something. Right. Now, that's the thing. In this arena, do you think, like, you know, sometimes you can't create chemistry. Can you create, a, can a stylist be created, or do you think you're born with that? I think it's a combination. I think you have to be smart. Mm -hmm. I think that the reason that, I think artists are genius. Right. I Me think, too. I, I uh -huh. like to think artists are genius. Yeah. I think that the reason that I'm successful and that I'm in this industry is because I'm smart and shrewd, mm -hmm. and I'm paying attention. But I'm artistic and have good taste. Right. <laughs> now, now, of course, we all that might be questionable. <laughs> now, we all want to make money. 
do you sometimes feel the need, or I should say you don't feel the need at this stage, but is it important that individuals recognize that you're not always going to get paid when you're in the beginning? Sometimes you got to just go hard and know that the experience might Absolutely. be the payoff. Absolutely. You should never do anything for the money. <laughs> Period. I don't think so. Right. But at some point in time, because we have I mean, we have to eat. Right, but because sometimes point, but well, if you're doing it, if you're doing it for the passion and you're well and you're, you're really qualified at what you're doing, you're skilled with it, the money's going to come. It's going to come. Exactly. And all the accolades, oh, it's a saying, it's the saying, what they say, do what you love to do and do it so well that people can't take their eyes off you. Mm -hmm. So now we got Marquis Fashion, you've already conquered the view, you got the Emmy, so you're like, okay, it's time for the next thing. You got your fashion show going, you're booked till August. Where's Marquis Secret going in the next five years? You tell me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows the sky is the limit? Uh -huh. I don't know. I let life um, take me on my journey. Do you have any, like, what I, what I would like to see is? Well, I would like to see um, a Marquis Empire <laughs> in fashion and hair. My mm -hmm. own hair products, my own lines, a school. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. A beauty school. You know, right, right. a whole empire to empower and help people too. Now that word you just said is so poignant because I was going to lead to my next question, the word empower. I'm saying how does it feel when you know you've done some things and you're still still building your empire and you know you're able to reach down and lift other individuals up as you're climbing. How does it feel like when you see the Diego and other individuals who are aspiring to get their fulfill their dreams? And you know that I'm in a position or I've gotten to a position where at least I can make this happen for the next person now. What is that feeling like? I never thought of that. <laughs> I absolutely never thought of that. I haven't done it for reward. I've done it because it's what I want to do. Right, but I mean other persons, like somebody wants to be a stylist. You know, but they, they haven't conquered things. They haven't done the thing. They're still trying to get an agent. They're still trying to get the Ghetto Black Hair magazine to give them a break. <laughs> So you're able to, you know, create an opportunity, thus with the Marquis well, Secret, I guess creating opportunities. Well, I guess it's a certain amount of success. It's a certain amount of doing what I started to do mm -hmm. and working on that. So, it, you know, that's what it is. It feels like I'm reaching my goals that I want. Right. And I'm working toward them, though. Right. I mean. Exactly. But, I mean, when you see another, like, like Diego, he needs a shot. You give him a shot to show off his clothes as you got... Designers. So for the next uh, eight months, you're going to be new designers showing up their stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. They may not have otherwise had the opportunity where there's no marquee secret is what I'm saying. So recognizing that you're able to provide that opportunity for exposure for these aspiring designers and stylists, how does that make you feel? It's good. It's my dreams coming true. Oh, it's your dream coming it's true. It's me working hard mm -hmm. to have that. That's my dream coming true to be able to do that and to be able to give and through my experiences. And I got all different kinds of experiences that add to this that help and that I try to pull together to um, inspire them and get them there. And hopefully they might get there and come and help me too. <laughs> it's about right. creating a network. What I'm really trying to do is to create a network um, of people. And unfortunately, it's a lot of minority people right. who don't get seen. Right. So I'm trying to create a fashion network of the people un who are unfortunately minority to be able to network and be stronger in the industry and have a voice, a vision, you know. Okay. So I think some of the design now, because, um, you know, everybody's into fashion, some of the more designers that you give an opportunity, have you had some favorites, some really, you like their style, you like the way they design their clothes, you have some favorite up and coming? <laughs> I try not to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. How about this? No, 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 like them all. no favorites, but some very. Can I tell you something? Some very what I've folks. learned. Let me tell you something. Okay. What I've learned. Okay. Sometimes I don't like what's going on or the clothes. Mm -hmm. I don't like the clothes, but that's not my place. It's their vision. Right. So my job is to make everyone feel good and show and try to represent them in the best way that I can. Does that make sense to you? No question. No question. Right. Now, before we get out of here, you know, we said so much. <laughs> I've enjoyed this interview. Is there one thing you want to let people out there know, just that they, people are seeing you, but, you know, something that Mark, he might have never had the opportunity to say, you know, next time I get a chance to talk to the world, I'm going to let them know, because, you know, we all we global with this thing. Any last words for the people, Mark? Um, it's nothing wrong with being a little different. You never know what you might get. <laughs> I got five enemies. <laughs> And I ain't mad at you, brother. I appreciate it, you know. 
as you know, you see at home, it's always about, you know, commitment to self. It's about dedication. It's about perseverance. It's about humility. It's about knowing that if you put your mind to something, you can achieve it, irrespective of what others may feel about you. You know, I always say never let your opinion, someone else's opinion of you, become your opinion of yourself. You heard from a gentleman who, you know, didn't, maybe didn't have the support. People wasn't feeling what his passion, his dream was. But he knew what he wanted to do, and he stayed focused. And now he's a five-time Emmy Award winning hairstylist. So I want to thank my guest, Mr. Marky, for being in. You definitely keep up with his website. He got fashion shows going. You're going to see us there at the Urban Wall Street Project on location because, you know, we're all about bringing genuine to you um, the best things, the greatest things, the newest things. So we're going to see some new styles, some fly fashions. And it's a beautiful thing. All nine is a great time. For all my aspiring entrepreneurs, you know, I never let it get out of here. Join the Urban Wall Street Project Business Club because we're making some huge things happen internationally. Now is the time for change. You want to take care of your financial future. You want to really be in control, then don't leave it up to your boss. It's not your boss's job to ensure that you get rich. His job is to ensure that you get a paycheck. As always, you've been watching the Urban Wall Street Project. Keep your head up. Stay prosperous. Be mindful. Be humble. Know that you can. Till next time, peace. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> that was great, huh? Yeah. I am mad at that. I'm people enjoy it.